Hi, my name is James Green, and thank you for joining me on Your Catholic Faith Today. These days, it's becoming easier to get distracted from our faith by work, school, pop culture, and everything else going on in our busy lives. However, it is more important than ever to remember the true story of Fatima and how it can positively affect our lives. A story that begins with Our Lady, the Mother of God, appearing to three shepherd children over six months, some of the challenges they face, and culminating with the miracle of the Son, witnessed by over 70,000 people, Catholics, non-Catholics, and atheists. Let's begin with a prayer, though. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now I'd like to read the true story of Fatima, one of the most important stories of our time for all generations. Fatima is a village in the very center of Portugal, about 70 miles north of Lisbon. It consists of numerous little hamlets hidden away in the elevation known as Serra de Air. One such hamlet is known as Adjustrel, and it is here, and more especially in the surrounding rocky pasture lands, that our story is centered. On a, on a day unnamed in any other records, in the year 1915, four little girls have been playing in the fields. Lucia de Jesus dos Santos, a child of eight, was among them. When the son told them that it was midday, they sat down to their lunch, and having finished, began the rosary, as was their custom even at a tender age. During the recitation, all of them noticed the sudden appearance of a cloud in a form like that of a man hovering above the foliage of the valley. Like a cloud whiter than snow, slightly transparent with a human outline, was Lucia's description. The little girls were surprised and filled with wonderment. They could not understand it. They were surprised even more when the strange white figure appeared twice again to them. He was not paying now merely a visit, for he left an inexplicable impression on their minds. Although the impression remained with them for a long while, it diminished with time. Perhaps, but for the events that followed, it would have been completely forgotten. A year passed. Lucia, as usual, was out in the fields with the sheep. This time, her little cousins, Jacinta and Francisco, were her companions and her playmates. We had gone with the sheep to the section of my father's land that lies at the foot of the cabezo, Lucia recalled, giving us for memory the exact details. It is called the Casa Vala. About mid-morning, a drizzle began to fall. Seeking shelter, we climbed the slope, followed by our sheep. It was then that we first entered the cave that was to become so sacred. It lies in the middle of one of my godfather's olive orchards, and from it can be seen the village where I was born, my father's house, and the hamlets of Casavela and Era de Pedra. The olive orchards extend for long distances until they seem to become one with these small hamlets. The rain stopped, Lucia went on, and the sun shone brightly, but we spent the day in the cave. We had our lunch, and after the rosary, we started to play jacks. We played only a short while when a strong wind shook the trees and made us raise our eyes to see what was happening. For the day was serene. There, above the trees, towards the east, we began to see a light, whiter than snow. It was the form of a young man, transparent, more brilliant than a crystal, pierced by the rays of the sun. Lucia tried to describe each detail of his appearance. As he approached, we began to distinguish his features. We were so surprised and half-absorbed, and we could not utter one word. He came near us and said, Fear not, I am the angel of peace. Pray with me. The angel knelt on the ground and bowed very low. By some inspiration, they imitated him and repeated the words they heard him pronounce. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love thee. I ask pardon for all those who do not believe in thee, do not adore thee, do not hope in thee, do not love thee. He repeated this prayer three times. Then he arose and said, Pray this way. The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications. 
The angel disappeared and the awareness of the supernatural was so intense that for a long space of time they remained there in the same position in which he left them, unaware of their very existence, repeating the same prayer over and over again. We felt the presence of God so intensely, so intimately, that we dared not speak even to each other. The next day, we felt ourselves still enveloped by that same atmosphere. Our very gra only very gradually did his intensity diminish within us. None of us thought of speaking of this apparition or of recommending that it be kept a secret. It imposed secrecy of itself. It was so intimate that it was not easy to utter even a single word about it. Perhaps it made a deeper impression upon us because it was the angel's first clear manifestation. Children being children, the special fervor that did wear, did wear off and it was not long before they went back to their daily round of playing, singing, and dancing. One notable effect remained, however, which seemed to fit in with the events that followed. The three little cousins were content to spend all their time together. When the summer months came, bringing with them the scorching heat of the sun, the children were awakened each day to their sheep out in the fields while the grass was still covered with the morning's dew. When the heat burned off the dew, and the sheep's hunger was dulled, the children led them back again to the barn to stay there until evening, when they would again be led out to the fields. Meanwhile, the three cousins spent their days playing their games under the inviting shade of the fig trees. When they were tired, they relaxed at the well under the lacy foliage and the olive and almond trees. It was while resting there during one early afternoon that the angel visited them again. Lucia tells us what happened. What are you doing? The angel suddenly appeared at their side. Pray, pray a great deal. The hearts of Jesus and Mary have designs of mercy for you. Offer unceasingly to the most high prayers and sacrifices. But how are we to sacrifice ourselves? Lucia said. Offer up everything within your power as a sacrifice to the Lord, an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended, and of supplication for the conversion of sinners. Thus, invoke peace upon your country. I am her guardian angel, the angel of Portugal. Above all, accept and bear with submission the sufferings that the Lord may send you. Only Lucia and Jacinta heard the angel's words. Francisco only saw the angel and knew that he was speaking to the girls. Burning with curiosity, he wanted to learn what, he, what had been said. Jacinta, tell me what the angel said. I will tell you tomorrow, Francisco. I am not able to speak now. The little girl was so overwhelmed, she lacked the strength to talk. The next day, as soon as he got up, Francisco asked Jacinta, Could you sleep last night? I was thinking of the angel all night long, trying to guess what she said to you. Lucia told him all the angel had said. The little lad could not grasp the meaning of the words of the angel and kept interrupting. What is the Most High? What does he mean? The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications? When he learned the answers, he became thoughtful. Lucia relates, and then again started asking other questions. But my spirit was not yet entirely free. I told him to wait for the next day. Satisfied, he waited for a while. But he did not miss the first opportunity to ask new questions. It made Jacinta raise her voice saying, Take care! We must not speak about these matters. Every time we spoke of the angel, says Lucia, I did not know what came over us. Jacinta used to say, I don't know what happens to me, but I cannot speak, play, or sing. I don't have the strength of the smallest thing. And Francisco would remark, neither can I. What does it matter? The angel is more important. Let us think about him. In later years, Lucia revealed, the words of the angel were like a light that made us realize who God was, how he loved us and wanted to be loved, the value of sacrifice, to what degree it pleased him, and how it was rewarded with the conversion of sinners. From that moment, we began to offer to the Lord everything that mortified us. Without trying to find any other ways of mortification or penance than passing hour after hour, bowed to the ground, repeating the prayer that the angel had taught us. Autumn drew near. The children stood out with the sheep to the hills for the whole day. They were due for another surprise visit. We wandered from Paraguay to Lapa, going around the hill by the, the side of Edistrel and Casavella. Lucia continued her report. We said the rosary there, 
and the prayer that the angel had taught us in the first apparition. Then the angel appeared to us for the third time. He was holding a chalice in his hand. A host was over it, from which fell some drops of blood into the chalice. Leaving the chalice and host suspended in midair, he prostrated himself on the ground, repeating this th prayer three times. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly, and I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of the same Jesus Christ, present in the tabernacles of the world. In reparation for all sacrileges, outrages, and indifferences by which he himself is offended, and by the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and through the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of thee the conversion of poor sinners. The angel then arose, and holding the chalice and the host again, he gave the host to Lysia, and the contents of the chalice to Jacinto and Francisco, while he said, Take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by ungrateful men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. He prostrated himself on the ground and again repeated with the children three times the prayer, Most Holy Trinity. Then he disappeared. The full meaning of this vision unfolded slowly and astonishingly to their young minds. Their whole being became absorbed by a new, strange, yet happy feeling of the inward presence of God. They kept silence for some time. Francisco was the first to break it. He had not heard the angel speak and was anxious to learn everything. Lucia, he said, I know that the angel gave you Holy Communion, but what did he give to me and Jacinta? The same. It was Holy Communion, Jacinta replied at once, overflowing with joy. Did you not see that it was with the blood dropped from the host? I felt that God was within me, he agreed, but I did not know how. The three of them remained kneeling on the ground for a while, repeating over and over again the inspired, heart-stirring prayer of the angel. The eldest of the three children, to whom Our Lady was to appear at Fatima, was Lucia. Lucia de Santos, born March 28, 1907. She was the youngest of the seven children of Senor Antonio de Santos and his wife, Maria Rosa. They lived in the hamlet of Agistral, which is situated as an oasis among the rocky hills of Ayer, forming a part of the village of Fatima. Senor dos Santos was a, former, was a farmer whose small holdings were scattered about the hills of the vicinity. Lucia was always healthy and strong, although her features, a rather flat nose and a heavy mouth, suggested a frown. Her sweet disposition and keen mind were reflected in a pair of dark, beautiful eyes, which glistened under their heavy lids making her most attractive. She was particularly affectionate towards children and very early began to prove herself to help mothers in minding their young ones. She was singularly gifted in holding the attention of the other children by her affection and resourcefulness. She is remembered also as being fond of dressing up. At the numerous religious festival festivals, she was always among the most colorfully dressed of the girls. Moreover, she loved these occasions for their gaiety and especially for the dancing. Lucia's father was like, many, was like many of the men of his class. He did his work, performed his religious duties, and spent his free time among his friends at the tavern, leaving the children completely in the care of his wife. And she was in every way equal to the task, even if perhaps a little strict in her discipline. Devoutly religious, Senora Marisa, Maria Rosa was possessed of more than the average common sense, and, unlike most of her neighbors, she could read. Thus, she was able to instruct not only her own, but her neighbor's children in the catechism. Evenings, she would read to the children from the Bible of other pious books, and sedu sedulously, she reminded them of their prayers, urging them particularly to remember the rosary, traditionally the favorite devotion of the people of Portugal. It should not be surprising, therefore, that Lucia was able to receive her first Holy Communion at the age of six, instead of ten, as the custom was, was dictated. Francisco and Jacinta, the other two principals, were Lucia's first cousins, the eight and ninth children respectively, born of the marriage of Senor Manuel Marto and Senora Olimpia Jesus de Santos. This marriage was the second for Olimpia. 
Her first husband, having died after giving her two children, Olympia was a sister of Senor dos Santos, Lucia's father. Francisco, their youngest boy, was born June, 9, June 11, 1908. He grew to be a fine-looking lad, in disposition much like his father, Timarto, as the parent was usually called. Lucia recalls particularly how calm and condescending Francisco was, in contrast to the whimsical and light-hearted Jacinta. Though he loved to play games, it mattered little to him whatever he won or lost. In fact, there were times when Lucia shunned his company because his apparent lack of temperament irritated her. At, these, at this time, these times, she would exert her will over him, making him sit still by himself for a period of time. Then, feeling sorry for him, she would bring him into the game they might be playing, and Francisco would remain apparently unaffected by the treatment. Yet for all this, his father recalls, he was sometimes wilder and more active than his sister Jacinta. He could lose his patience and fuss like a young calf. He was absolutely fearless. He could go anywhere in the dark. He would play with lizards, and when he found a small snake, he made it coil itself around his staff, and he filled the holes in the rocks with used milk for the snakes to drink. Timarto, though, Timarto, though he literally, was a man of real wisdom and prudence. <clears throat> he had a remarkable sense of values, and he must have instilled into his mind, into the mind and heart of Francisco, a deep appreciation of the natural beauties of life. Young as the boy was, he loved to contemplate the world around him. The vastness of the skies, the wonder of the stars, and the myriad beauties of nature at sunrise and sunset. <coughs> Francisco loved music too. He used to carry a reed flute with which he would accompany the singing and dancing of his companions, his sister Jacinta and his cousin Lucia. Jacinta, born March 11, 1910, was nearly two years younger than her brother. She resembled Francisco in features, but differed sharply in temperament. Her round face was smooth-skinned, and she had bright, clear eyes and a small mouth with thin lips, but a somewhat chubby chin. She was well-proportioned, but not as robust as Francisco. A quiet, troublesome infant, she grew to be a lovable child, though not without an early tendency to selfishness. She took easily to a sense of piety, but was equally given to play. In fact, it seems to have been her idea sometime before the apparitions <coughs> to reduce their daily rosary to a re repetition of the first two words of the Hail Mary, a practice which, of course, they hastily abandoned in due time. Jacinta had a strong devotion to Lucia, and when it became the latter's chore to take up the sheep up to the hills to the graze, Jacinta pestered her mother until she was given a few sheep of her own so that she could accompany her cousin to the hills. <clears throat> Each morning before sunrise, Senora Olympia would awaken Francisco and Jacinta. They would bless themselves as they got up and say a little prayer. Their mother, having prepared breakfast, usually a bowl of soup and some bread, would go to the barn to release the sheep, and then returning to the house would prepare lunch with whatever was at hand. Probably bread with olives, codfish, or sardines. By the time she had finished this, the children were ready to go meet Lucia with her flock of sheep. Before the apparitions, they used to meet with other children, but after the apparitions of the angel, these three stayed more or less by themselves. Lucia would select a place for the day's pasturing. Usually they went to the hill, hill country, where Senor de Santos owned some property. Sometimes, she took them out to the open country around Fatima. A favorite place in the summer, however, was the Cabezo, a grassy hill that also offered the shade of trees, olive, pine, and home oak, as well as the cave. It was much closer to the home than the other pasture lands, and the children found it best for playing. One of Lucia's earlier companions recalls, Lucia was a lot of fun, and we loved to be with her because she was always so pleasant. We did whatever she told us to. She was very wise, and she could sing and dance very well. And with her, we could spend our whole day singing and dancing. And Lucia remembers, even today, all their beautiful, simple songs. When they heard the sound of the church bells, or when the height of the sun told them it was noon, they stopped their playing and dancing to recite the Angelus. 
After eating their lunch, they would say the rosary and then go on with their playing. They would return home in the evening in time for supper, and after the night prayers, they would go to bed. <clears throat> May, the month of flowers, follows the long April rains that wash the face of their mother, Earth, after her long winter sleep. Then God covers the world with jewels more beautiful than any precious stones. What could be more beautiful than the dainty, many-colored flowers of May? On Sunday, the 13th of May, in the year 1917, during the midst of the First World War, God sent to earth the loveliest flower of the ages, his own beautiful mother, Mary, whom we address as the Queen of May. On that day, the children went to early Mass. Heaven forbid, Senora Marto said, that we should ever miss hearing Mass on Sundays, whether it rained or thundered, or even if I were nursing my babies. Sometimes we had to go to Bolerio, Otogua, or Santa Catarina, almost six miles journey. I had to get up early and leave everything in my husband's care. He would go to a, late, a later mass. We could not take the babies with us when they were little, for then neither we nor anyone else in the church would have been able to hear mass. Babies look like angels, but they don't act like angels. Returning from the masses, the mother packed the children's lunches and sent them off with the sheep. This day, Lucia and her little cousins met as usual at the small bog, beyond the village, called Barrerio, on the way to Jevia, whence they proceed to the Cova de Aira. Because the ground was rocky and filled with so much brush, they crossed it very slowly. It was almost noon before they reached their chosen spot. When they heard the church bells summoning the people to the last mass, they knew it was time for lunch. So they opened their bags and ate, as usual saving a little for later on. Their meal finished, they spread, sped through the rosary and then chased the sheep up the hill. Their game today would be building, making castles out of rocks. Francisco was the mason and architect. Lucia and Jacinta gathered the stones. While they were thus busily intent upon their building project, a sudden bright shaft of light pierced the air. In their efforts to describe it, they called it a flash of lightning. Frightened, they dropped their stones, looked at each other, then at the sky, which was clear and bright, without the least spot of a cloud. No breeze stirred the air, the sun, and the sun was shining strong. Such perfect weather bellied this flash of lightning, the forerunner of a storm. The children decided that it had, been, it had better start out for home before it rained. Quickly, they gathered the sheep and started down the hill. Halfway down, just as they were passing a tall oak tree, another shaft of light split the air. Panicky with fear, as if led by some unknown power, they took a few steps, turned towards the right, and there, standing over the foliage of a small home oak, they saw the most beautiful lady. It was a lady dressed all in white, Lucia records more brilliant than the sun, shedding rays of light, clear and stronger than a crystal glass filled with the most sparkling water, pierced by the burning rays of the sun. Fear not, the lady said. I will not harm you. Where are you from? Lucia made bold to ask. I am from heaven, the beautiful lady replied, gently raising her hand towards the distant horizons. What do you want of me? Lucia humbly asked. I come to ask you to come here for six consecutive months. On the thirteenth day, at the same hour, I will tell you later who I am and what I want, and I, I shall return here again a seventh time. And I, am I, to, and am I, to going to heaven? Lucia asked. Yes, you shall. The lady assured her. And Jacinta, yes. And Francisco, he too shall go, but he must say many rosaries. The lady responded. Lucia asked some more questions of the lady. Two girls used to come to her, her house to learn sewing from her sisters and recently died. Lucia wanted to find out about them too. And Maria de Rosario, daughter of Jose de Neves, is she in heaven? Yes, the lady replied. And Amelia? She is still in purgatory. <clears throat> Lucia's eyes filled with tears. How sad that her friend Amelia was suffering in the fires of purgatory. Then the lady said to the children, 
Do you want to offer yourselves to God to endure all of the sufferings that he may choose to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and as supplication for the conversion of sinners? Promptly, Sia responded for all three. Yes, we want to. Then you are going to offer, suffer a great deal, the lady promised, but the grace of God will be your comfort. As she pronounced these words, the lady opened her hands and she shed upon the children a highly intense light that was as if it were a reflection shining from them. This light penetrated us to the heart, Lucia reported, and its very recesses, and allowed us to see ourselves in God, who was that light more clearly than we see ourselves in a mirror. Then we were moved by an inward impulse, also communicated to us, to fall on our knees while we repeated to ourselves, O most holy trinity, I adore thee, my God, my God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. Again the lady spoke to them, Say the rosary every day to bring peace to the world, and end the world, and end the war. She began then to elevate herself entirely, serenely. Lucia said, going in the direction of the east until she disappeared in the immensity of space, still surrounded by a most brilliant light that seemed to open a path for her through the myriad of galaxies and stars. Well, that's all the time we have on this episode. Uh, as we learned, our lady, we heard... We got introduced to the three children. Uh, we heard about Our Lady First Appearance and the Angel. Thank you for joining us, and I hope to finish the story the next time we see you. Pray, pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell because they have no one to make sacrifices and pray for them. <laughs>